Um, so let me now start to formally welcome you and introduce the session. So this is the session of security coordination and policy of the EOSC Hub Week. So just a, uh, the question, why, why, why do we do security? Why are we talking about security? I think people are well aware in this, in this day and age that uh, the internet is a, is a hostile environment. The fact that we're doing federated access with distributed infrastructures, with open scientific communities and computer networks um, leads to a sort of special threat landscape in which we, um, which we live. And the security risks of that need to be well assessed and well managed. The aims, of course, are to maintain the services, confidentiality, integrity, and availability of services and, and of the data. Um, and so everything we do is aimed in that sense. There's an information security management team in the EOSC Hub project in WP4 um, subtask 4. And our, we are charged with coordinating the security issues across the infrastructures that participate in EOSC Hub. Our primary aim is to avoid security incidents, but when inevitably security incidents still happen, we are charged with coordinating the handling of those between the various security teams across the infrastructures when they do happen. And it's a pleasure that we have a, um, a fairly large number of members of the team who you're going to hear from today talking about various aspects of that. And so in terms of the agenda, we'll start with uh, Vincent, who will talk about, uh, as, an, as a, an opening example, a recent security incident. Then there'll be a number of talks looking at how, what, what we do to avoid security incidents, what lessons do we learn from incidents and assessing risks from Orpo. Linda will talk about handling software vulnerabilities. I will talk about trust and policies. And then there's a group of people, I think it's just Roma, David talking, are gonna talk about threats and sharing intelligence amongst the communities. Then Sven will go into handling security incidents and uh, Roma will end up by uh, talking about, about um, how can we improve coordination amongst the security teams. So we're gonna start with a, a Slido poll just to see who it is we've got in the room. I can see the numbers are going up. We've got now 50 participants. So if you can actually go to the slido.com, uh, select 19th of May. So this is for everybody participating, please. 19th of May, security coordination. And uh, if I can find it. And then I guess I want to show this. We could show this as well, couldn't we? So if I stop sharing that and now share this. And so now you should see that the question, what is your current role? Question mark, select all that apply. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six possible choices. And we can watch the answers. So that's two out of 55. So it's fascinating to watch this grow as time goes on, right? But uh, um, what, what I think I will do, I mean, please, please do uh, all of you participate because it's, it's good for us to know who we've got uh, actually in the audience. So we're still only getting uh, a small fraction of the people. But we could leave this, we'll leave this poll running uh, while we go on to the... Uh, Sorry, David. For, Sorry, David. Yes. Could, could you share the link for the Slido on the chat so everybody can access to it? Ah, okay. Thank you. Um, it's just slido.com. Ah, okay. And the EOSC, well, it's, it's actually in this thing here. Join at slido.com. It's on the slide. And the, uh, the events code is EOSC Hub Week. And then you have to select the room, 19th of May, security coordination. 
Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so about half the people have answered so far. Um, what's interesting is that we have a, uh, a really nice spread of all categories. It's at least good that the, uh, the other category isn't the maximum in that I've forgotten important roles that you all have. Anyway, I will leave that poll running. So please uh, carry on answering that. Um, and now I will hand over to uh, Vincent, who's going to start us off and talk about uh, a recent um, security incident. I'll stop sharing. So Vincent, over to you. Right. Uh, so I will be presenting a, sec a recent security incident that happened in our communities. And I think why uh, cooperation is important. Let's start with a disclaimer first. Uh, the incident in here occurred within the last year. Uh, it's a real incident, and I will be presenting it from EGIC search point of view. Uh, unfortunately, as this forum here is quite public, uh, I will not be able to share most of the details, and you will see in particular that I will not be sharing uh, names of the affected places or victims or the precise dates. Uh, to be clear also, to the best of our knowledge, there was no EGI or ES curb resources which were directly affected by this incident. But the thing is that some of the affected resources were close to us and our users were thus affected. Uh, and last but not least, this presentation is not about the incidents affecting HPC right now, it's an older incident. So let's see how this started, or rather how we learned about the incidents. So first of all, one site, let's call it A, discovered uh, some compromised systems. What was bad for us was that what was compromised, or part of what was compromised was what we call login or user interaction nodes which are what users use to connect uh, to access all the systems, which means that user credentials were stolen. Uh, thankfully, uh, this site decided to share these details with their collaboration, uh, not with other sites, and we are really thankful to them for that. In particular, they directly contacted another academic place, that we call B, uh, to tell them that the malicious connection that they initially seen was from their own uh, systems, and they were recommending to look for connection from the active systems to see like, if they were malicious connections. Uh, we learned about it, we as a GI, uh, through cross-community membership because within different committees in Europe, we do have cross-membership try to collaborate uh, as much as we can, but we were not directly affected, so initially we didn't pull that out. Well. However, we were later contacted by B, which was, if you remember, the source kind of for the attack at the time, uh, tried to analyze uh, the malware found and track the match activity, and asking for help to notify the victim and contact the incidents because we have quite some good contacts there. So we tried to start helping as much as we could for coordinating the response, which meant trying to build up a central view of the incidents with all the victims, the IOCs, the details that we could collect. Uh, broadcasting those RCs within our community, try to identify more victims. And uh, last but definitely not least, uh, for every time we had some more detailed suspicious activity linking to someone to share directly with the victims or through the national initiatives. And then the incident grew a bit. However, let's, uh, let's first take a small interlude on what actually we're seeing. So by the end of the incidents, we had three pieces of malware uh, that we analyzed and fully reverse engineered. And that was thanks to initial collaboration between different people and particular security systems have nothing to do with us, but we're really thankful for ourselves. Uh, so we had one malicious OpenSH daemon, SHD, which was a backdoor, which was providing hidden boot access, so no longer nothing, when you were lock, uh, knocking on it from the right ports. We had also malicious OpenSH clients, which was stealing some credentials, and we was the storing those into a local file, which was like user, passwords, and the remote host name for any admin connection. And there was a malicious bot, which was connecting to some command and control servers, waiting for incoming command, in particular commands to uh, get the credential of the local system. 
in terms of malicious activity, uh, were able to identify some previous creation mechanisms. Uh, for example, there was at least one zero day uh, on the storage system elements, which had been communicate, communicated with the vendor and is now patched. And there was at least another case where it was uh, some common uh, storage miscreation that was applied. But what was interesting at the time that we found no functionality, no like malicious functionality, but those solely used for discovery spread of persistence. So as I said, we had, they were stealing more credentials to access new nodes. They were installing backdoors to keep access to the systems. And they also had some tunnel and proxy functionality so that they could like hide themselves behind uh, stolen systems. But there was no clean mesh activity. There was no cryptocurrency mining. There was no network abuse. And still to these days, we don't know why they came in. All right, back to the incidents. So what we tried to do after notifying everyone we could was to track back the attack to its origin. We had quite some clear network activity. We had the connection from the bots to the uh, CNC servers, and we had incoming mesh connections. Unfortunately, all of these came from systems which were outside the academic community. So it was a bit harder for us to contact uh, the owner of the systems. Still, uh, our co security colleagues from B managed to convince uh, the owner of the systems to give them access, with access, and that, in fact, happens more often than you might thought. Uh, and this system went and modified to try to gather, uh, again, more evidence on what was going on, which means that not like remove, kicking out the mesh sectors, but keeping them in to try to collect more, which meant collecting IPs uh, that was used to connect to the CNC, try to track back the next level again and again, and also connecting the IPs of the victims, either due to the bots connecting to the CNC or outgoing SSH connection from this, uh, some sort of servers. And indeed, we identified uh, more victims uh, places, either due to the IOCs we broadcasted, uh, because it's reached not only our site, but usually a bit around our sites, because people have, are more than just the security admin for our site. And also thanks to the communication when it had precise IP to communicate. Those were at different stages of infection. Some of them were fully root compromised. Sometimes some root empty were exploited, for example. And in this case, it was quite bad for us because it meant that you know, there was more credentials stolen and you, know, you have to follow up again to more devices uh, and get those fixed. Uh, some of them were only user level compromised, which means that you know, they got a stolen user, they were able to connect to the box, but they were not yet able to uh, uh, exploit the uh, vulnerability. Uh, so the incident started to be contained, you know, we were trying to wrap up things. However, some time were not fast enough. Uh, late in the incident, we received a list of uh, stolen credentials. Uh, to be clear here, these were shared in the interest of the users so that we can prevent that their privileges, the access were abused and, you know, that more damage will be caused on their behalf. So we shared those information with the security contacts of the affected hosts because the malware was storing the users, the password that we as a GI never saw, and the remote host name. Uh, we were told that the affected users had already been contacted and asked to change the password, but we wanted to make sure that the, uh, uh, the service uh, provider was also contacted. And in fact, at least in one case, the administrators of one of these uh, destinations was not con were not contacted, or at least did not receive the correct message. Uh, and worse, the stolen credentials were the one that they were having identified as the one being used by the attack. And even worse, it happened that the attack took place quite a while after the attack. In fact, after the credentials were found, but before they were shared to us and shared with this victim. So in fact, if, we had, if this had been shared earlier, basically the attack on that victim could have been prevented. And uh, yeah, we had one less victim. Sorry. Uh, on the other side, you know, to all, do all this containment, we took quite a few actions. We broadcasted all the RCs in our communities to try to get as much uh, things under control as possible, identify as much victims. 
every single academic system that we uh, found affected was taken down, you know, uh, credential and so on. And every stolen credential that we identified was changed, certificate was revoked, and so on and so forth. So quite quickly, the attacker realized that we were onto them and decided that to cut the losses. And they just cleaned up all the CNC the system we have access to and basically disappeared. So we lost track of them. So in the end, even though we you know, contained the incidents, we will never figure out who they were and what they were after. So going forward after the incidents, if you think about it, sharing an incident was the key to contain, uh, to contain it. We shared the IOCs, so the measures IPs we found, the measures files we had, uh, some TTPs and whatnot. But more importantly, I think, we shared information about the compromised systems and the compromised accounts, in particular with the victims themselves, being the, you know, the, the administrators or the actual users. Uh, and I think that our community is small, uh, so, you know, so within EGI, we have the right uh, rules and so on, but the community and the diversity of the community is growing. There are already different initiatives in place, EGI, UDAT, PRESS, and many more, and we do try to have suppression between us, but, you know, it's not as close. But more importantly, with EOSC Hub growing and EOSC growing itself, there will be many more services, many more providers coming, and because our users are quite all the same, we will still have all this together. So I think we need to overcome uh, those uh, sharing barriers between us. And there are many. There are like fear for some damage, trust issues uh, between us, or legal issues like GDPR. But it's very important to overcome them so that we can in the future handle incidents. Um, that's all what I had to present here. I see that there are. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Vincent. I hope people appreciate that that's the a sort of good, a, a good example of the of the uh, the sort of problems we can uh, we can all jointly have to to deal with in this distributed research and IT environment that we work. And you've also, and Valsal, you've also given us some ideas about um, what we need to do to improve things. Um, I don't see any specific questions on that in the. Uh, the oh, there's just just time for one quick question, Valsal, and then other things will come up later. I'm sure. Says thanks, for our Great overview. How long did the response take? Uh, that's uh, quite a complex question, I would say, because there was multiple steps. I think that from the beginning to the end, you know, it probably took more than a month uh, to get anything under uh, undercover and, and contained. I mean, initially, like you know, most of the response from each side were much faster than that. But in order to get all the chain and to get access to the systems and get, uh, you know, to provide all this information, get the information function provided, I think until we got uh, figured from that by the mesh sector and that they clean up the systems, I think in total it was maybe a month or two. But like most systems affected were usually cleaned up much faster than this. Okay, thank you. Uh, at this point, I think uh, we should say thank you to Vincent, and we'll go on now to uh, um, Orpo Kaila from CSC in Finland, who's going to tell us about uh, incidents and assessing risks and things. So, Orpo, can you share your, your slides, please? I will do that. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to meet you here, even virtually. Let's see if I can get this. Can you see my presentation now? So I would like to complement the presentation of Vincent from another angle. I was also heavily involved with the incident from our behalf, from CSC in Finland and EUDAT. But now I would like to look at security from the bird's eye perspective. What are the big bits and pieces because I see a constant confusion about this when, when, when we have complicated networks of, of infrastructures and, and communities. So I, I try to, to show you the big picture and I start with a little task for you. And I would like to you all to open the chat window and, and uh, reply to the uh, questions I will present here. Let's see. 
So we see a dispenser system here. Can you identify the security pieces here? What is the management systems? What is the con uh, security control for confidentiality, for availability? What are the risks? I lost my, oops, my screen turning. She's freezed here. Sorry, I have a technical problem here. Can you still hear me? I need to. Yes, we can still hear you, Oppo. Yeah, yeah we it's have a cool. problem with when I had a VPN on, it sometimes freezes. But. So we see there's a kind of a big picture about vulnerabilities, risk, controls on confidentiality, availability, usability. But it's always the same thing. Also, when you have computing infrastructure, it's still about risk, vulnerabilities, controls, and have kind of a sensible setup of this. People normally get lost in little details because we have a plenty of them. Let's see if I can open. So, Oppo, now, yeah, I'm going to say now we don't see your. Uh, oh, okay. View. We see the. Uh, uh, let's see if I can reshare it. Oh. Just a moment. Can you see it again? I can see your screen. Okay. So we have the same thing here. And the problem is that there are a lot of different people and teams involved. It's easy when you are doing it yourself or have a little team of five to six people. But when you have hundreds and thousands of people, you really need to organize the security so that everybody will do their own task about that. And also you need to have, be able to speak the same language and identify the roles of people who you are uh, communicating with. Because often in security incident, like the incident Vincent told us about, it's not all public. We cannot uh, publish everything at once at least, so we need to know who we trust. Oppo, can you switch to presentation mode or is that not possible? Let's try it. Is it better now? That's better, yeah, thank you. All right. So this is our new, new Puhti computer in, in Northeastern Finland. So the, my story is that it's the same picture all the time. Depending on big, big system or small system, or even analog system, uh, you need to have some kind of logic how you take care of security. Incident management is the start where we all have started. And there you can also think that what is your definition? I know the practices varies here. Somebody would like to keep it strict, focus on computer security, incident system compromises, and that's fine. But at least in my, my context, I prefer a broader uh, definition that whatever goes wrong, result in unexpected anomalies of confidentiality or integrity or availability. And also on our people and service rep reputation, that's an incident for me. I have keep track on incident in my organization for about 15 years and we have seen all kinds of them. And I must say that this kind of um, intrusions as we heard about, they're actually a minority and they're not even the worst one. The most problematic are one or kind of fault, unexpected fault or malfunctions which we cannot identify. Fortunately, they don't happen very often. Um, but also we have physical in incidents, data center incident, and one Especially when I'm also representing EUDAT, that we are really afraid of, 
is something which is called the data rot, something that breaks integrity slowly without anybody noticing it. And now, today we have this COVID-19 pandemic, and it's very good to have uh, incident management uh, in place when we get meet this kind of uh, situation because it was very easy for our organization to to follow already well established roles and, and ways to work how to how to handle this very special situation so my my experience as my my personal learning just incident management is a starting point but it's kind of multi damage control that you cannot make your system secure only with incident management. You need, of course, to have a plan for that, both technology and roles, and also communication between peers internally, and also um, to the media. It's, it's over half of the incident management. And we are, it's not a one-man job or one-team job. Incident management is not only for security, but we need to involve all the roles in our communities, like admins, service managers, communications, senior management, our CSER teams, and our security contacts in, in our infrastructure. That's what have just happened with this current incident we heard about. Oops, sorry, I'm getting there. So, what, what is the way to make the big picture? Well, I call it risk management, because you need to start with the risk and not with the tools. And the way to cope with the risk, we are some, sometimes perhaps a little bit over-focused on technical controls, like access controls and authentication, and we yes, uh, absolutely need that. But the, the biggest challenge, I think, is in organizing things and how, how get all the roles involved in, in your communities about that. You need to have some kind of a comprehensive plan and process for that. And you cannot apply your security controls in in random order or bit by piece, you need to start somebody. And the plan should be based on risk management. So how we do risk management, there are well established tools for that too, but in our context, in research, computing and networking, it's a little bit foreign concept compared with commercial companies where I, I come from. But I feel that the increasing pressure that we should um, apply risk management also for our services. And that's what we are currently doing in EOSC Hub as well. We are using a template we have um, developed jointly in one of our communities, the WISE, using mostly the standard model, but it's a little bit difficult to get everybody involved for that. So, at the end of the day or, or the period, I would like to see that most of the core services in EASC should have been undergone a risk management with all the uh, stakeholders involved. So that was my little message to you. I hope I, I hear from you later on. If we have time, maybe perhaps we have time for one question still. Okay, thank you, Orpo. I don't see any questions in the in the chat window at the moment. Any burning issue right now? But by all means, carry on answering, answer you know, asking questions in the chat window. Um, sure. During the session, and we can even if we don't answer them during the session, we can answer them afterwards. Put them in the notes. Thanks. Okay, so thank you to Orpo. So now it's my pleasure to ask uh, Linda Cornwall to tell us about software vulnerabilities. Can you share your screen, Linda? 
trying. If it doesn't, if it didn't work as I expected, I'm trying to uh, work out how to, sh to ah. Does that work? Yes. Right. And it's not it, but it's not in presentation mode. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, right. It's not slideshow. Is it now? Uh, it's changed, but now we see your presenter view. I think if you are the double screen, I think you have to go to display settings and invert the two screen. I couldn't hear what that was said. Um, because you've got two screens, you need uh, display settings. And the... Yes. Uh, if I put, unplug this, it'll probably... I can't see how to make that work. Uh, Alternatively, I can slow the sh show the slides for you. Shall I do that? Yeah, okay. I can't stop it. I can't work out how to stop it. Stop share. There we go. And then I need to find share. There we go. Yeah. Over to you, Linda. I can't see the slides. Am I not showing them? I was showing them. No, we sorry. Um, yes, David. I've not. No, yes, now you can see. Uh, now we see them. Right, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me to talk, and it's nice to see so many people interested in security and how to prevent incidents. Um, uh, the one of the causes. One of the things that can cause incidents is if there are software vulnerabilities that can be exploited and then you get security incidents. So we set up quite a long time ago the software vulnerability group to minimise the risk to the EGI infrastructure arising from software vulnerabilities to prevent security incidents. And we've been handling software vulnerabilities in EGI and its predecessors for more than a decade. And next slide, please. We've got a procedure for um, uh, handling vulnerabilities, which has been, we started really about 2006, and um, uh, it's changed a little bit since. And basically anyone can report a vulnerability to um, report vulnerability at EGI EU. If it's not been announced as fixed by the software provider, SVG contacts the software provider and then we investigate the issue. If it's relevant to EGI, we assess the risk in the EGI environment and put it into one of four categories, critical, high, moderate or low. If it's not been fixed, the target date for resolution is set. Um, it's high at six weeks, moderate four months, low one year. And then an advisory is issued to sites by SVG if it's high or critical to the EGI infrastructure or if we're the main handler of vulnerabilities. For example, it's community software that we're um, the main person that looks after these things and no one else is issuing vulnerability announcements. And um, uh, Or if there's a good reason to send an advisory. Sometimes we even send an advisory because something's in the news and it's not relevant to us. We just send like, maybe a... Uh, information then just saying look you know we don't need to worry about this um and critical vulnerabilities are handled with top priority and we try and do something within a day we have special procedures for those which i won't go into in this five minute talk and uh, we had a document um which approved and how to do that so next slide please um we're trying to evolve svg at the moment it's pretty proving quite tricky because the EGI infrastructure is increasingly inhomogeneous, so you can't just say, oh, this is the effect of this vulnerability in our infrastructure, because there's so, so many different configurations and different bits of software in use. 
and uh, there's a services in the EOS catalogue. Um, currently, if you search, there's 261 services in the catalogue. I mean, some of the traditional EOS, uh, EGI services and some application services, all sorts. And we need to consider how to prevent vulnerability and address vulnerabilities in this wider catalogue keep the whole thing secure. Well, we can't tell people what software to use. Uh, people are doing their own thing, doing what works for them. But we can't, but nor can we be experts in all the software in use. It just doesn't scale, it doesn't work the way we've been doing things for the last um, more than a decade. So for it, as a start, we've been saying those who select, develop or configure software should at least consider software security. We made a 10 point checklist where you can look for things that, um, uh, you know, common problems, common things to check, like is there, uh, is it under maintenance, who's the provider and a few other things. And um, then if you're selecting or deciding how to deploy software, you could consider doing the software the deployment expert group where you can help look look out for vulnerabilities help us tackle vulnerabilities when they're um uh, when they do come up um that allows people to volunteer expertise we're just trying to get that going actually i've um uh, we proposed it a few months ago but we haven't really got it started yet the idea is that help services help one another stay secure and avoid vulnerabilities uh next slide please the main messages are very simple. If you find or suspect you found a relevant software vulnerability, if it's not public, don't disclose it. Don't put it on a public web page or discuss it on a public way in the or anything like that. It's, um, uh, you're probably causing a lot of problems if you do. Report it to those responsible for the software without using a public forum. For example, a lot, of, a lot of software providers have somewhere where you can report problems and report it confidentiality most do sometimes we've found ones where we've had a real difficulty finding who to report something to but that's rare um, also report it software report vulnerability EGI EU we can you know then we, we get to know about it if you think it's relevant to EGI and if you don't feel you can report it to the people who um, are responsible for software we'll try and do that as well we've done that a few times before um, and if you wish to help us if you wish to help us and um, help various services help one another, you can join the Deployment Expert group. Consider emailing me or, or SVG Rat, and we can think about that. So, um, next slide. I think that's it. Thank you. It's very simple. Um, so, thank you, Linda. Yeah. So, I, I'm not looking at the chat window right now. Are there any questions in the chat window? I don't see it. No one, yes. So, okay, if not, um, let's... Um, there, there, is, there is one question we came just now. Ah, okay. Uh, known software vulnerabilities are often communicated via CVE. Would it make sense to become CNA? So I didn't hear. So it's in the chat window. Known What's software vulnerabilities window? are often communicated by CVEs. Oh, it right. makes sense to become a CNA. CNA. It's an acronym we don't know, Johannes. <laughs> it's an acronym. It's the people who can actually deliver uh, CVEs. Um, All right. Um, well, we haven't in the in the past. We've gone for a very simple. Um, uh, critical high, moderate, low. Um, and also, we tend to look at the CVEs um, to see whether the look at the um, CVE score to see whether they're um, high. If if something's got a high CV CVSS score, obviously it's probably high. But sometimes in our environment, the way we, especially when we started doing the grid, um, um, some things that probably had a higher score because the way we use the software didn't really affect as much and other things other things um uh, which probably in a distributed environment were more serious than the scores so we just decided on our own but no we haven't tried we haven't thought about that maybe we should look at it so 
So uh, there was a question from Mark as well, I saw. So yeah, let's, let's let, let Mark speak, please, uh, Diego. Go, Mark, you can speak now. Sure, thanks. I'll just repeat what I wrote, uh, and that is that uh, I'm curious to see how the different interest infrastructures are dealing with uh, security vulnerabilities inside containers that are brought by users. So missing patches, and this could be VMs as well, uh, missing patches for design in general. Um, I, I keep asking this question and I yeah. don't, no one seems to have a good, a good solid answer, but uh, maybe that's just the life we lead. Uh, I don't think we have a good solid answer, but we tend to sort of, We've tended to, for um, the cloud services, we tended to say you have to use, use approved um, images um, inside containers. We, in, in EGI, we've tended to sort of say you can only use, run certain, certain images, but um, uh, there is still a big area, in, area there. If, people, if we are allowing people to run any software they like inside containers, yes, of course, there's, we can't always control everything. But for um, cloud, the cloud, we had a approved images type of thing we will run. Yeah, and so the, uh, the only other approach is just to assume that the containers are compromised, right? This is and then... Uh, <laughs> deal with them appropriately. This is uh, the same way uh, that many commercial cloud providers just uh, hold you responsible for what goes on. Um, yeah. Sandbox you, you in such a way that you cannot do damage to anybody else. I think we should move on. We're running a bit behind time. So now, thank you, Linda. Um, now it's uh, my chance to tell you about um, trust and security policies. You see those slides okay, I hope, yes. No, if I can get them for focus. So, Oppo already mentioned the WISE community. This is the WISE Information Security for E-Infrastructures, which is a collaborative activity between multiple infrastructures across the world. And we decided in EOSC Hub that that was a very good place to actually take our um, standards from in terms of trust and, and policy uh, templates, as it were. So uh, as people know, security policies are one of the managerial controls you have for miti mitigating the security risks that uh, um, Oppo was talking about. Um, through the, our membership of the Global WISE community, um, we base our policies and procedures on the WISE Security for Collaborating Infrastructures version 2 trust framework that was published in uh, 2017 and the EU Horizon 2020 ARC project uh, authentication and authorization for research collaboration that produced a very nice policy development kit and we've taken our um, EOSC hub policies from that policy development kit and these will be taken forward under the auspices of WISE. So there are three policies currently in the information security management uh, process in the EOSC Hub service management system. There's a top level security policy that applies to everybody. It's sort of setting the uh, um, attitude of the, the infrastructures as a whole towards security and giving various people rights and um, responsibilities, but I won't say any more about that today. Then we've got the AUP, the acceptable use policy and conditions of use, which I'll show one slide on, and also um, a security policy relating to service operations within EOSC Hub. So let's start with the AUP. This is based on the, uh, the template that came out of the, the ARC policy development kit and is now taken forward as WISE as the baseline AUP version one. The idea of a common baseline AUP is to actually benefit the infrastructure and services and indeed the, it makes it simpler for the end user. They don't have to, to read and sign a different AUP for every service they access. If, the, if there's a common baseline AUP require, uh, containing all of the required uh, policy statements, they see that whenever they register either with their research community or their infrastructure and then new infrastructures and services are confident that the new user was have already accepted this. 
so gradually this is gaining more and more traction there are more and more infrastructures around the world who are using this AUP and we've decided to use it in EOSC hub and so if you're looking around as a service operator to, um, for an AUP we encourage you to consider using this uh, this baseline AUP it's just 10 simple policy points and to which you can then add your own uh, GDPR privacy notice and any other service conditions which are different from the uh, add more detail to um, other other issues to do with the AUP. Here are the 10 bullet points. I'm not going to go through these. We don't have time. They're there for um, complete this for you to look, but they're, they've been widely discussed by many infrastructures across the world and agreed um, within the WISE community. So that was the AUP. Then for service operators, we have a, uh, a security policy based on the, again, on the uh, policy development kit. Um, this applies to all EOSC hub, hub services, obviously not to the other ones that are onboarding into the EOSC hub catalogs, but we encourage other services to, to consider adhering to its requirements because it's a good statement of best practice. It meets the requirements of the WISE SCI version 2 trust framework, and it has policy statements about the collaboration with the infrastructures and the security team. And here again, there are just eight bullet points with a few sub bullet points addressing things like uh, you'll see in bullet point two there, provide and maintain accurate contact information, including at least one security contact who shall support certify, which is another um, published uh, instant response trust framework compliant with SCI. And lots of statements there which are very useful so if you're not a hub if you are a hub service it already applies to you if you're not a hub service we encourage you con to consider um, abiding by this so this will stop tour through where we are with policies in EOSC hub um, now I can't see the let me go out of that screenshots Okay, so I think at this point we just uh, we move on. So now we're going to look at the threat landscape, um, security threats and sharing intelligence and what have you. And I believe Roma, you're going to speak uh, first. Is that true? Yes. Thank you, Dave. Yes, just a very brief word of introduction uh, for um, David and, and Liv, you who are doing uh, a lot of the work there to to explain a bit of the of the context and, uh, and in particular um, that as you said earlier in this day and age uh, the internet is a fairly hostile environment and in particular as a as an infrastructure research infrastructure we have to, uh, to tackle a number of threats uh, that are stemming um, typically either from cyber crime which is uh, involving huge amounts of money uh, and so there is a high incentive for criminal organizations uh, worldwide to attack our resource centers, but also from nation states, uh, as it was demonstrated uh, multiple times, and including by uh, Verizon and other uh, studies where they reported that around 20% of the attack last year were uh, tied uh, to malicious act or linked uh, with nation states. So uh, it means that the adversaries we have to face um, as a community are, are really well funded and organized. Um, on our side, we have, of course, limited efforts and resources, uh, especially uh, on those sides who have uh, smaller uh, teams or less experienced teams. Uh, it, it might be very, very difficult because most participants uh, in our community cannot afford threat intelligence feeds or dedicated security appliance or uh, the services of, of security companies, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, it's pretty difficult and also even if you could afford all this um, the information you really want has to be uh, relevant and targeted for our particular community and and this is very hard so really at the end of the day the, the only way to to address this issue um, is, is to have a full community-based uh, instance response and threat intelligence and, and this is uh, this is really an important aspect uh, the idea is that the first participants observing an attack shares uh, the details and the specific with others uh, as quickly as possible, uh, ideally via automated, automated mechanisms, so that everybody in the community can be protected. And then we also mutualize 
uh, expertise uh, to address the issue and uh, and respond to the particular um, attack at stake. Uh, and really, this is 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 um, the best means to fight uh, sophisticated adversaries at an acceptable cost. So, so really, uh, the message here is that threat intelligence and and having sites uh, being able to make use of it is really the cornerstone cornerstone of the. Uh, strategy in our operational security uh, and, and our security capabilities. So what do you want to do here uh, from the next speaker uh, is, is pretty important in this context. Okay, thank you, Roma. David, we, we had a, a Slido poll that we could use, but I think we're, given that we're running a bit behind time, maybe we should skip that for now. Um, sure. Is it, yep. is no. It okay with you. And I mean, if there's time at the end, we could always ask the audience. But if not, we just skip it. No, I agree. And I think just to but uh, to give people a flavour, um, as 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 Roman was discussing the importance of threat intelligence, and as I try and talk and share slides at the same time. Uh, here we go. Hopefully, you can see that now. So if I present those slides, uh, yeah. And so as I as I talk as I talk to this, uh, really particularly one of the things that we're interested in and, and the sort of the poll questions that we had uh, were around what people were currently doing and what they are one of the, you know even what their hopes and dreams of what they would like to do in this context. Um, so let me let me get started then. Um, uh, can I just ask you just double check that you can hear me? Yes, we can hear yes. you and your great. slides are in presentation mode, so that's fine. Perfect, just to that, yeah, great. Okay, so uh, um, I'm gonna talk for the next sort of five or so minutes about now looking at threat intelligence and security operation centers and really following on from, from what Roman was saying, this is really cooperation through intelligence sharing. And again, uh, as Roman mentioned, um, allowing WLCG sites to digest and make active use of threat intelligence as a, as a cornerstone of the WLCG security strategy. And in fact, the WLCG Security Operations Center Working Group was established to enable the deployment of security tools to enable this. Um, but although this began as a WLCG activity and it has a specific mandate there, in fact, um, this has wide relevance to a, a much wider community and so the working group now has members from uh, across the, the, the academic research community, uh, including um, institutional uh, CSERTs and NRENs as well. So it's a, it's a broader group, but it has a specific focus as well. Um, and so the, the mandate of the working group is to create reference designs to allow sites to uh, ingest security monitoring data of different kinds, to enrich this data, store it and visualize it, and then to alert based on matches between the stored data and threat intelligence using indicators of compromise or, or IOCs, which is a very common um, uh, abbreviation. And so the three of those uh, capabilities together um, forms what you might call a security operations center. Um, uh, um, you might also have seen this in the context of analytics for security. And the working group has been working on an initial model for such a, a, what you might call a minimum viable product of such a SOC. And it has four, um, four phases. And I'll show you the phases here. And then on the next slide, just have a table with the technologies, just so that you have that for reference. The first phase, uh, which is data sources and threat intelligence, is really the core phase. It's um, the threat intelligence that you're receiving uh, from external parties, from trusted partners, and the, the intelligence that you generate perhaps within your organization and want to share different parts, or as you're developing it, make sure that you have an active copy of it. And then alongside that, you need some kind of monitoring system. And so we currently specify two of these in the model. One of them is the uh, Zeek intrusion detection system, formerly called BRO, and that offers deep pack and inspecting capabilities. So you tap network traffic and then the system um, uh, inspects uh, every packet. So it gives you very detailed, very granular logs 
which are great for looking back to see exactly what happened and telling you everything that happened. Uh, the, the, the flip side of that is that it has a, you know, a specific hardware requirement to let you to, 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 to use that capability. And then the other source that we've currently specified is using NetFlow or SFlow um, or IPv6 IP um, uh, to provide network flow metadata. So this is at the other end of the scale where uh, now what we are seeing is uh, metadata about particular connections. So endpoints, um, IP addresses, port numbers, timestamps, metadata, but then not the details about exactly what's happening in the packets. But again, now uh, that data is typically very often found in a wide range of switch manufacturers and there's, um, there's host-based clients that you can use so that information is very readily available, but uh, offers you a different, uh, a different level of information. Going back to what I was saying earlier about the, the range of, of, of uh, teams that are part of the working group. For example, you might expect that uh, an intrusion detection system is something that particularly a larger site would have. For example, CERN, who has a, a, pro, a production um, security operations center, uses Zeek. Whereas for at the, at the NREN level, they are not going to have that level of uh, of monitoring, but they will have really detailed and really broad based NetFlow uh, data. So um, it's really matching your your requirements and your capabilities to what you need. So then the next phase. So now we have our data. It's great. Um, you know we, we're tapping the right network point, or we're using our NetFlow. Now we want to ingest that data, and so uh, based on its ubiquity and common use, uh, we've we are using uh, Logstash and therefore the other components um, in, the, in the current initial model. And so we specify two pipelines, one for Zeek, um, which is based on the use of JSON logs from Zeek and then using the, the FileBeat uh, um, transporter to, to ingest that data. And then for NetFlow or SFlow, there's a, a, a really nice um, a Logstash package called Elastiflow, which is a set of pipelines and dashboards which are really effective for this purpose. Then we use Elasticsearch, uh, which leads directly from Logstash for uh, storage and Kibana for visualization. And then the last phase, which is really important, is the alerting phase. And so um, there are two options here. One of them is a set of uh, enrichment uh, correlation and aggregation scripts that CERN has worked on for their own purposes, but is making available more generally, which um, allows specific alerting based on key information, trying to package that up. Uh, with the most important things you need to know. And then also the last alert um, um, package, which was uh, originally developed by Yelp, um, which lets you report on lots of different filters uh, inside Elasticsearch. And so that gives you a, a very, very uh, quick overview of the initial model. And as you see there, some of these uh, elements like Elasticsearch and Kibana are essential. And then some of them, and, and MISP, of course, as our threat intelligence platform, but then some of them are optional, but you need at least one. So you need at least one data source and you need at least one uh, alerting system. And this is a place where alerting is really important because you can't spend your whole life looking at dashboards. There are lots of them. So you need to have the system be proactive in telling you when things are happening. Okay. So here is the technology stack. I'm not gonna to talk too much to this now because I've already covered a lot of this ground, but for reference, and there are links there to the different components if you're interested, um, but taking you through the different parts and, and, and kind of why we're using them at each, at each phase. Okay, so let me move on. So I mentioned MISP there as our threat intelligence platform. And if the use of threat intelligence and its, and its active use within a site is cornerstone of the WLCG, um, sort of WCC security effort, MISP and the threat intelligence platform itself is the cornerstone of the SOC because this is what lets you uh, share securely uh, uh, indicators of compromise with trusted partners to pull that information and then to update that for the community. And so the model that we're using is a, is a hub and spoke model, which is based around a specific academic instance, which is hosted at CERN. And this allows us to benefit from the trust relationships that CERN already has and the experience they have in this field. And so the event data that's contained within it is primarily uh, TLP green and TLP white. So as a reminder, 
This is information which should be shared um, within a community, but is not publicly available, and information which is publicly available. Um, but in addition to that, uh, CERN has some events which are classified as TLP AMBER, which should then only be shared with trusted contacts, um, but gives you uh, more detailed information about a live incident. And so it's particularly useful for finding issues um, and tracking uh, malicious traffic at, at participating sites. And so with this service in place, there is a, a, a document detailing the rules of participation uh, for the service, which is uh, currently um, in preparation. So what's the current status of all of this work? So at the moment, we have a number of prototype systems at different sites, uh, including um, the, the, the RAL Tier 1 in the UK. And this is in addition to a production fully featured SOC, um, which is uh, in daily use at CERN. Um, I haven't featured that here, but if you imagine the, uh, the, 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 the diagram I showed earlier, but with you know, uh, substantially more um, uh, um, developed hardware and infrastructure, then that's effectively, it, it shows the, the aspiration for the, the SOC as a whole. And so in terms of deployment, our focus at the moment is supporting uh, the, the, the grid, the tier one sites in deploying these tools. Um, not only as the sites who are likely to have more resource to do this, but also where um, you know, they, they see the, the, the most traffic and so the biggest impact of having the sharing in place. And then from a, an, an operational deployment perspective, it also lets us gain experience with the tier ones and then can, can uh, filter that down to the tier two sites. We also have a end-to-end -end test of the intelligence sharing thought workflow that we used at a workshop in October, uh, Nikev, where we generated a MISP event at CERN based on a demonstration of malicious traffic. Uh, we downloaded something and then said, okay, we're, we're calling this traffic, uh, generated the event, shared that with an STFC prototype, and then demonstrated that we could then cause an alert to be raised based on triggering the same traffic. So we've seen that the system works end to end, and now we can work on growing our capabilities at different sites. And let me leave you just at the end with some contact details for more information. Uh, Liviu and I, who, who uh, jointly leads the, the, the working group, are very happy to hear from anyone uh, working on this who wants to work on this. Um, and also you can see more uh, details about the working group uh, itself as well as uh, publications and, and and reporting we've done on this at the at the web page there and so with that i'll say thank you very much and ask if there are any questions okay thank you david i don't see any questions right now in the chat window Shop staring. so if not let's uh, now move on to sven who's going to Tell us about incidents, etc. So Sven, can you do you have some slides? Can you share them? Yeah, I try. Um, let me see. Oh, okay. Um, I will get there. Good. Hold on. eventually. The thing is that I now probably have you as well on the screen. Yes. <laughs> Wait. Shall I share the slides? 
Uh, yeah, why not? Yeah, if you have them, David, that would be good. I'm afraid I don't have them, so. <laughs> oh, look. Excellent. Over to you, Sven. Go on. Excellent. So, uh, welcome to the to the presentation then on on, on incident handling in uh, in in, in EGRC cert. So, um, well, since we have have some new faces, so my name is Sven Gabriel. I work for the Dutch National Institute for Subatomic Physics, NICEF, um, here in Amsterdam, and I am the EGRC cert security officer. So, next slide, please. So. Um, if you if you if you come to the situation that you have to handle an incident, you will see that that having a um, computer security incident response team um, comes in handy. So let's let's first start with with uh, a couple of of uh, brief notes on on how to set up and and further develop a CSET. Next slide, please. So this is this is actually a rather a rather. Um, Long process, and it will also not 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 really not really stop. So, this is something actually every um, computing um, say project somehow has to has has to go through. So, at the beginning, you will have some 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 steep development curve. So, it will, things will go go quick. Um, ideally, you would already have some policy framework existing um, before before the the, the C cert starts operations. Um, this is in in particular needed since uh, well, security operations by by nature um, will will um, will get in in into into the ways how how users think they can they can use the infrastructure and you you will end up in disputes and you don't want to have have them during an incident here you only only want to present a policy look this is this is what we what we all agreed on and uh, please do like that or otherwise um, have a have a way to to escalate it to some to the next um, to the next level um, when you when you when you when you have um, the, the, the the basic setup of your of your CSET, you also want to be want to be a bit more clear about um, the services you want to provide and uh, more more important here um, under 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 which authority? So if you are if you are simply an say if you, if you only send advisories to to your to your constituency to your to your users to your customers, um, so you probably only would need a very a very weak authority. So you can you can always send some information, but if you then um, what we, what we will see in, 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 a, in a couple of slides, when you then want to do something like uh, vulnerability management, where you then would um, require the sites to take action and you want to, and you want to enforce it, um, you already would need some authority from, from, the, from the governing bodies you are, you are operating in. Um, well, this, this then again depends on what services you want to provide. Um, we have in, in HRC search, so we, we do we do quite a quite a quite a quite a bit, um, which which also needs some some authority. Um, well, further you of course need to say something um, well on the on the on the service level you want to you want to 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 provide this for do you want to do something like 24 7 then you would need a very different budget than than what we are doing so we are doing um nine to five and uh and and for the rest best effort which is which is uh actually covers uh quite 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 a bit of of the of the cases we have to deal with well when you have all this setup, and you also have some 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 information compiled on uh, well on, on for example on how to how to contact your your CSERT. You then would also um, reach out to other teams and build your um, trust network. Next slide, please. So as I said, so this is a this is a long process, and if you if you if you if you look at the at the, at the timeline um, on when we where, where we actually came from. Um, this is uh, well, well before um, um, people like Google Azure or, or uh, Amazon Web Services um, started. So we had at the beginning the, the European data grid and then, well, 
Facebook came, they meanwhile well, overtook us. Then we had the Aggie One um, project, so the, the, the series of, of the Aggie projects, which uh, where, where, the, where the goal was to set up a compute, globally distributed compute infrastructure um, for research with the with the with the with the well with the biggest customers being the the physics particle physicists um, using the data generated at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Um, what you what you what you see here also is that uh, in 2003 already the, the the policy group started their work, and then in 2005 the operational security coordination team um, started. So this was the the, the predecessor of ECIS research, which was. Uh, well, led by, by Roma, who is, who is talking a bit later. And then finally in 2010, we had, we had the EGIC set where we had some, some, some major changes on how the infrastructure looked like and how it, in particular, how the, how the organization of it um, looked like. So during, during all these years, we, we, we did quite some development from, well, starting first with, with uh, well, Indeed, just a just a just a mail list, and then also building up services for our for our constituency. Next slide, please. So this is then actually um, then then maintaining a CSERT and further developing it. To do it, you you would you would constantly run and update your services to to new developments and to you to new um, technologies. You want to you want to automate this in particular in a in a, in a, in a case like ours where you have uh, more than two hundred um, security teams at the resource centers. Um, you you really want to have this as automated as possible, and you also want to have procedures for your services so that uh, this more or less runs automatically and you and you have um, a minimal interaction with uh, with 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 people. Um, uh, triggering a response, for example, but uh, for the majority, it, it should just work. An example for that would then be the vulnerability management. Um, next slide, please. We do, so this is, this is uh, the, the, the um, vulnerability management cycle. And, 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 and an example on how we actually um, make sure that, that the, our infrastructure is, is, is a bit, is, is a, at least, Let's say, let's say in a, in a good shape, so that you cannot easily um, well explore um, old vulnerabilities to to just uh, escalate your privileges and uh, abuse the infrastructure. So how does this actually work? So a vulnerability is reported to to us. Us in our case would mean the software vulnerability group, uh, which is headed by Linda. She talked before about that. And um, here you, you have the, the usual steps. So first you want to verify, well, this uh, vulnerability indeed is affecting our infra. The criticality or the impact is, uh, has, has this at that level. So in, in, in our case, we, we only distinguish between uh, critical or high. Well, moderate, we, we do not, we do not um, follow up on. And then if we have critical vulnerability, this information gets sent over to the moni monitoring team. They then update their sensors and probes. We get an get an overview within within one day um, which parts of the infrastructures are detected. At the same time, already the, the, the resource centers get information about the, the, the vulnerability issue and they start updating it. And then um, after a couple of days, we then um, handle in, in the incident response task force, which is led by, by Vincent, who, who had the, the, the presentation on the, on the incidents earlier. Um, which is then handled by, by, by this team and they then also make sure that uh, that the actually the, the vulnerability is, is patched. All right. Um, so every part of it actually would would is is a, is a, is, a, is a presentation in itself, but just to be just to give and give an overview here. So um, the tools you 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 want to have. Um, the, the main part is in, 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 a, in a distributed um, infrastructure that you have proper communication tools. So we, we, we challenge them, well, regularly, uh, once a year. And here we use the incident response tools we usually use also in, in terms, of, in terms of, of incident response. So we have a contact database and we have a ticketing system. Um, 
the ticketing system fetches the, the, the contact information for the resource centers, every site gets, a, gets, a, gets, gets contacted by the accepted channel, so a mail, and in the mail we ask for a, for a measurable um, reaction of the, of the contacts, contacts. So for example, clicking, clicking the link. This then um, can be evaluated on the, on the on the web server, and we have a quite nice overview of the reaction times of our of our security teams. And um, for the ones who, for for every for, for whichever reason, did not did not uh, react, um, this then followed up by us or by by, by operations. But that we we um, we maintain quite a, a, a usable contact database and um, make sure that in case of an instant, we actually reach our, our sites. Next slide, please. So this then the result from, from, from this year's run. So this was in, this is raw data. So this is, this is, this is not cleaned up for, for out of office hours. And um, this was run during the, the, the Corona lockdown. Um, we see that we have, the majority of the sites already react quite quick, so within within um, 24 hours, and all what is then after these after one day, you can say, and uh, the, the the 260 sites we, we were we were challenging is then um, contacted separately, and we make sure that uh, that we get an explanation why this went not as smooth as expected. Next slide, please. Sven, I wonder how many more slides do you have because you're 50. We um, Roman time to yes. Well. Yes. So uh, let me let me let me let me let me simply skip about over the the, the, the security service challenges. So um, what is what is what is more interesting is um, the, the the incidents also the ones we we are, we are not looking now on is uh, is tend to affect the, the the neighboring infrastructure. So what you see here is the picture. What is what is uh, at the moment? So many devices connected to the internet accessing compute or storage resources. Um, this is even 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 more true at the, at, at the moment since um, people now have to work from home. We have in this link we have some some recommendations or some advisories on how to how to do it um, securely. Um, what I'm about here is to do exactly the, 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 the clusters that the people are using. If you have the, the, the situation as we had at the beginning that these clusters are, 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 are well, well separated, so the bluish ones are in EGI and the yellow and the amber one are in another project, this is not much of a problem. But what we see now, next slide please, um, is that these are really getting closer. So they, they have resources shared in, 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 different, in different projects and by that, Incidents also affecting another another infrastructure are getting quickly closer to off to us, and we have to we have to really um, make sure that we at least um, are a bit of ahead of things and and get uh, this information as early as possible, or even even uh, put our our defenses um, a bit a bit more outside. Um, yes, so here you then have the the the, the link to the to the. Um, some, some hints on how to do working from home more securely. Um, the contact info for the EGIC cert, and then at the end also the link to the incidents we were, which are, which are now well in the press. The uh, below link is, is, a, is a TLP white, and um, well, this is what we are currently busy with a bit. That's it. Thank you very much, Sven. Are there any questions? I promise, I promise to I promise to, to pre-record it and, and, and play it more 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 fast, but I failed to do so. <laughs> we got there. It's fine. So let's give the floor now to Roma, and then there may still be a few minutes for questions at the end. Okay, I'll promise I'll be very quick, Dave. Um, okay, thanks. So so really this is just to to conclude on the various talks on instant response and threat intelligence that, that our goal here is to, to be able to achieve um, a successful instant response uh, throughout uh, the global community, right? And, and doing truly global successful instant response is really, really hard. There are lots of technical 
uh, challenges ahead, but mostly the, the difficulties is um, coordination and, and the human factor. Um, as we've seen many times, individual security teams can be really good taken on, on, on their own, but collaboration is where uh, they, they typically struggle and, and, and this is a difficult part. Um, we, we, for example, conducted a, a security drill uh, between EGI and, and other security team uh, in the US and uh, um, the result was that they were really good taken uh, apart, but together there are really uh, areas where uh, they could do better and, 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 and synergies could, could be uh, optimized a little bit. And, and this really um, is what's at stake here, is how do we improve the coordination, the communication, and the different leaderships um, in, in global incident response. And, and we are in a unique position in the, in the academic and research uh, community where we, we are required to make it work. And, and I don't know of any other community who has had to, to deal with this challenge before. The, the, the key issue here is that, um, when you have distributed tasks and, and central tasks for different teams, they are really everybody's jobs, which effectively means nobody's job, right? And, and finding out who has to do what and getting organized is, is, is really, really difficult. So to put it in a nutshell, I mean, what, what we try and, and do here is, is first identify the key stakeholders uh, at peer infrastructures and, and really approach them and identify these contact points. Then what really does help is to define a joint strategy for instance response, like a workflow model framework, what have you, where the roles, uh, the different leadership activities and the expectation of each other teams are explicitly defined. Now that really, really helps. Uh, also reminding that, uh, remembering sorry, that there is no boundary for security incidents. Right, they don't stop at the gate of the research uh, infrastructure or the e infrastructure. So it's very important to keep an open mind, um, make sure that we have good relationship with the campus or the scientific security teams to get the relevant information, and don't limit ourselves to the exact scope uh, of uh, the mandate of our um, respective security teams. Um, so the best way to really help ourselves is to uh, coordinate and, and help um, others as well. And, and this is really the essence, is, is really how to, to uh, collaborate and, and cooperate at the global scale. And, and this is why it's so key uh, for the whole project. So that's what I have. I hope you enjoyed the different presentations. And I think we still have a few more minutes for discussions and, and questions. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much, Roma. So either type questions in the, uh, in the chat room or raise your hand and we can allow you to speak. Do you know how to raise your hand? Yeah, I see Mark as so. Go, Mark. Yeah. Hi there. Um, can I speak? Yes, yes. Please do, yeah. Okay. Um, in all of these presentations, I haven't seen any discussion of human resources and training. Um, I know that's a, a significant factor in, for example, ISO 27,000, uh, uh, procedures and, and practices. Uh, I also know it's an extremely difficult uh, problem when you're dealing with many, many different organizations and many, many different uh, sets of HR policies and even labor unions. Uh, any thoughts, any good ideas, any common approaches uh, that are being used? Uh, maybe it's buried in some documents and we just haven't gotten to it, but I'd be curious to, to be at least pointed to all your good solutions. Very good question. Does one of my colleagues wish to uh, address this? So, so this was about about training or? Well, and resources, right? This is. Uh... Well, if you have, if I can jump in, let's say you have 10 people at a given institution who are responsible for, you know, running an important resource in the infra, in the broader Federation, um, uh, there's an assumption that those 10 people have been properly trained in security processes uh, as it applies to their jobs and that they are 
in some cases, uh, shall we say, certified or they reach a certain level of capability and understand the requirements of expected of them. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious what, what, how the, the Federation, the, the joint operation, uh, looks to each participant, each partner to, to accomplish the objective. Yeah. Okay. So, so for example, for for HIC, for the incident response task force within within HIC, so we have the requirement if you if you want to be a member there, um, you need to have some basic training in in, in operational security. Um, that that uh, this 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 training happens um, actually, or the, let's say the, the 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 monetary aspect to it is actually subject to well the the, the employee of the of the potential IOTF member. So this is this is the the, the the training part for for the security people. What we what we do internally in the in the project is that we that we also provide trainings to our to our security um, teams at the at the sites. So we have uh, we have various people who are on on a on a, on a well, who are professionally providing trainings or giving courses at universities um, that then also develop trainings for. Well, internal trainings for our for our for our security contacts. Does this help a bit? May well, it's certainly part of the equation. But thank you. May I also comment this excellent yes, question? Also, yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's a little bit sore point, and I think the issue is that we don't know always where to start. We had done some attempts with Sven and others. We already even had kind of a uh, admins security certification a long time ago, an experiment, but the scope is pretty broad. And as you said, this is a mandatory requirement in all security gov government that you have your staff and, and different roles properly trained. So maybe we should think about that again and, and focus a little bit. Should we focus on armies or security stuff for or management or who? Yeah, I'd just like to, to support what you say, Orpo. I mean, I think it's been well, well recognized that, you know, if we as the security coordination team can get sufficient resourcing from the projects and things, a vital, you know, one of our vital roles is the, uh, is the support of others and the training and the dissemination and we, we also offer, you know, forensic analysis services to people who may not be um, so well trained to be able to do those sort of things. But it's it's always a challenge. There's always more more that could be done than the funding we actually managed to get. But uh, I think coordinating these things and uh, sharing our experiences with people and trying to coordinate on a broad range, you know, broad range is, uh, you know, is one of the important things we should do in the future with EOSC as it as it moves forward. Right? Any other questions? I see a comment from Matthew. Institution is participating in uh, in e infrastructures will have a mature service management system, so they expected to invest in their information security management. Yeah. But as always, there's enormous challenges that we. Uh, we have small amounts of uh, funding which are expected to cover a large number of things and there's lots of important things we need to do so we need to keep lobbying for more money for security based activities anybody else with their hand up i don't see anything there okay if that's the case we've uh, perfectly reached the end of the uh, end of the session so first of all i'd like to uh, say a big thank you to all my colleagues for giving the, uh, the presentations and uh, also to all of you for attending.